guys, it's Kate from Erin Space and welcome to Antiques Deep Dive Part 2. Uh, today I'd like to talk to you about one of my very, very favorite things to collect, which is antique trade signs. So, um, the history of antique trade signs, we start seeing them in America right around 1750. Uh, you don't see a lot that are much earlier than that. Uh, we see them starting in 1750 mostly because people start to change the way that they lived. Uh, both we see um, commerce centers getting larger and larger so shops needed to advertise and more importantly uh, people began traveling from town to town to visit relatives to do business uh, and as you have travelers you need somewhere for them to stay and so travelers needed inns and taverns to stay at and inns and taverns needed to advertise that they were uh, taking in clients by having amazing trade signs that people would see and say oh that looks great I'll go in and have a beer and spend the night um, now I'm holding this sign, which is not an 18th century tavern sign, because unfortunately, and much to my chagrin, I do not own an 18th century tavern sign. They are extremely rare and extremely valuable. But this is very similar to the form that we see for the earliest signs. As with any antiques, there are variations on the form, and especially when it was up to the individual design and creativity of the sign maker. But this panel here with turned columns on the sides is one of the most typical forms we see for the first period of uh, trade signs. And there is a wonderful collection of 18th and early 19th century in and tavern signs at the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, and they can be traced frequently to uh, an individual who was, as a career, a sign painter. Um, one of the most famous of the early 19th century was a fellow named William Rice from Connecticut. and. Um, his signs are highly stylized, they're, they're beautifully painted, and he typically painted these, these resting lions on them that have a really appealing folk art appearance. Um, and they are incredibly valuable. So if you ever find one, you've just found a lottery ticket. Um, but yes, when things open back up again, I strongly encourage you local folks to visit the Connecticut Historical Society and view their sign collection. They have about 60 and they are incredible. So we see signs becoming a little bit more um, common in the mid-19th century. And I'll show you my earliest sign. This is a sign I purchased from a dealer friend named Cheryl Scott about eight years ago now. Um, of course, it's nice for me because my husband is a piano teacher and I knew I had to have it. So this is very typical of the signs that we see in the third quarter and the end of the 19th century. Um, it's got what we call sand paint, which I'm gonna bring this up close so you can see the texture on this. Hope you can see that it's very coarse. The reason it's coarse is they would add uh, an additive called asphaltum to the paint and that would make it the black surface mildly reflective. So at night the hope was that people could see it and this was in a time before we had um, gas lighting outdoors extensively so you're trying to attract people at night perhaps. Um, and so this is a very a very common form with the gilt lettering, uh, the sand paint, and then a frame. Um, and like most signs that were meant to hang outside it is double-sided typically on signs we see that one side has a significant amount of wear compared to the other side the reason for that was because as it was hanging outside one side of the sign would be facing the more severe weather if it was the wind would hit it more often or that's where the wind driven rain would be um, so it's a, it's a good indicator that a sign is real if it's got significantly more wear on one side versus the other. So um, this is probably one of my next earliest signs. And of course, it appeals to me because it says furniture refinisher, which is what I do for a living. Um, and this is an interesting sign because it, it has a story to tell, which I just love. And I'm going to, again, come closer and see if you can see that. And what it is is it's got a sign that was painted previously to the furniture refinished. Uh, this came from a uh, property up in northern Vermont. And originally, it was a sign for the Purity Inn and Tea Room, which you can just see the ghost of the original sign peeking through. Um, these were all signs, really, were considered utilitarian objects. They were frequently reused. Um, so you could see many layers of paint as, say, the business that was occupying that structure changed from being a tea room to someone refinishing furniture. Um, so it's a nice way to be able to trace the history of a sign. 
Um, another way that we can find the history on a sign is sometimes they have inscriptions on the back. This is a lovely little sign I picked up about 10 years ago. Um, and the inscription on the back, which is very faint, so I'm not going to show it to you, but it says Biddeford, Maine, March 1st, 1911. Um, and it was probably written by the sign maker himself. And uh, my parents live in Kennebunkport, so it's a very local sign to, to my family. Um, and through that bit of information, I was able to track Dr. Hearn. And he was actually, he was a young man. He had just gotten out of medical school. He practiced medicine for exactly one year in York, Maine and Biddeford. And then he quit because it was not for him. And he ended up being a farmer for the rest of his life. So this is just an, a lovely little time capsule of someone's personal history on a sign, on a utilitarian object. And once again, um, just like with the piano teacher sign, we can see the gilt lettering and the asphalt on the sand paint there, um, which really truly is one of the most common um, appearances for these late 19th and early 20th century signs. Now, not all signs do have a story to tell, at least not one that we can trace. So here's a wonderful little sign that I picked up for $15. Uh, probably about the same age as the Dr. Hearn sign, I would say probably 1900 to 1915, and it says for sale. Uh, and was probably made by someone who was a fairly skilled sign maker because it's quite handsomely lettered. Um, but we don't know who made it and we don't know what was for sale, but still attractive and unique. This, for example, probably was not made by a professional sign maker. This was probably painted as kind of an at-home job, and who knows what was open, some shop maybe, a little cafe or something. Um, and it's also a really great example of the wear being much more severe on one side versus the other. Now, not all signs were made of wood, though that's very typical. Uh, there's another whole category of signs, which we call figural signs. This is one of my most treasured figural signs. This is a pocket watch trade sign. It's made of very heavy metal. Um, and it hung outside a shop in New York right around 1911, a jeweler shop. And we see figural trade signs from the mid 19th century forward and they're often extremely appealing and attractive. Um, great big five foot large pretzels or pens that are nine feet long to, to advertise, you know, um, a, a shop selling paper and pens. So um, this would have been ordered out of a catalog versus being made by a professional sign maker or someone in their own home. Um, and I've seen catalog advertisements for this exact pocket watch trade sign. And then the uh, jeweler would have had his specific name, which I think this says uh, H.E. Tivy, McTivy, uh, painted on it and then sent to him. So um, you do see these from time to time. There's usually at least one pocket watch trade sign on the floor of any good antique show at any good, given time. Another figural trade sign that I own is this lovely liar here. This is probably also late 19th century uh, and probably was used to advertise perhaps a music shop, maybe someone selling instruments, uh, repairing instruments, or perhaps also a music lessons business. Um, and it's just, you know, sweet, gilt, pretty straightforward. It probably wasn't made by someone particularly professional, but it's, it's, it's nice and lovely. Now, not all signs were made just on flat surfaces either. This is uh, probably from the second quarter of the 20th century, so maybe 1940, 1950, and it says Music Hall, and it's on tin. Um, and of course, this would have hung outside some sort of a nightclub or something like that, a dance hall. Uh, we also have signs that were made out of paper. Now these were often used to advertise events that were not permanent. So this one is for an auction that was held in Maine in 1865. Um, and these broadsides would have been hung just to advertise say a fair or a play that was coming to town or of course an auction. And they were meant to be put up, up for maybe a week and then taken down and just very, you know, they get stored and tucked away. So you, you can find them. Um, I think this one was about $85 at an antique shop, and I thought it was really, really amusing and sweet. Um, and really, antique signs cover 
all different types of categories. This is a sign that I got from a friend, David Pirelli, who's a wonderful Connecticut antique dealer. And it says flea market, which I love flea markets, so I had to have this. Um, and again, it probably dates to about 1940, 1950, if I had to guess. Um, and this is kind of fun because it's on a piece of wood that was reused. Uh, so someone salvaged a piece of wood from, I'm gonna guess this is probably like a barn or the panel to a cabinet, and then used it to make this sign for their flea market that they were having. Now, the reverse of that is that because signs were considered utilitarian objects, nobody really valued them as important folk art, which is one of the reasons that the earliest signs are so rare and hard to find. Um, they were often reused for other things afterwards. Um, and one of my favorite sign stories is my aunt and uncle own a wonderful 18th century house in Andover, Connecticut. And probably 25 years ago, they were taking down one of the dilapidated barns. And as they took it down piece by piece, they found a, um, a sign that had been used just as, as board, essentially, um, on the side of the barn. And this isn't the sign, but it's very similar to it. Uh, theirs was also a hand that's pointing and it said Tolland. So it probably would have been used uh, on one of the roads to indicate that that's the, that's the road going towards Tolland. Um, and so when they found it, we were all extremely impressed and pleased. And it's probably fairly early, like 1840, 1850. Uh, and that now sits on their mantle, which is, which is nice. But a good example of how signs were just kind of used and abused. Not only were they exposed to the elements outdoors, but again, they were often either repainted to make new signs or used for other things. And that wear pattern that we see from the use and abuse is a good indicator that a sign is real because signs do get faked. Um, it's, they're very popular and the best signs can bring pretty high uh, numbers in terms of value. Uh, so people, unscrupulous people do make fakes. Uh, and so, like I said, looking at a wear pattern and making sure that perhaps one side of it has um, a lot more damage than the other side. The other thing you want to look at is, um, let me see if I've got a good example of this. Do we mark it? Here we go. I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this, but I'll hold it up and tell you anyway. You want to see that the damage goes through the lettering and not that someone took an old piece of wood that had cracks so it looks very antique and then apply the lettering afterwards to make it some very appealing sign that says something like clam bake or something. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing to look at is that the wear and the lettering, uh, there's continuity between the two. And I just want to show you a fake sign. Uh, so all dealers make mistakes, all collectors make mistakes. This was a mistake. Uh, the Karunda, which I believed had been on perhaps a ship, um, and I didn't even realize it was fake until I went back to the shop where I bought it and there was another one right where the old one had been. So they were definitely buying them and selling them and it was presented as being antique, but it's not. And one of the things that makes me think that um, I should have looked a little closer is that the crack allure, which is the way that the paint begins to separate from the surface it's applied to, um, is extremely inconsistent and doesn't really make sense uh, across the sign. So somebody applied that to make it look like it was damaged and older than it is. Um, but one of the best ways to protect yourself from purchasing things that are not real is to uh, buy them from reputable dealers, which um, the Antique Dealers Association of America is a great place to start to find great dealers. So, in conclusion, um, one of the big questions that people always ask is, I have an antique sign, what is it worth? When we judge the value of an antique, we're looking at three primary facets. We're considering age, rarity, and condition. So if you have all three, your object, there's a good chance it's going to be valuable. Uh, an early tavern sign, of course, is very old, let's say 1805. And if it's in excellent condition, that would be very rare um, and also important. So a good early tavern sign could easily bring $150,000 to $500,000 at auction. Most of the signs I've showed you today, I've bought for under $500. In fact, only one of them, which was $565, um, is over that amount. The vast majority, like this lovely open sign, this was, I think, $15 at a flea market. So you can certainly um, collect antique signs, enjoy them in your home, 
and uh, you don't have to spend a fortune. And it's a great option instead of a live, laugh, love sign that was made at TJ Maxx. So thanks for tuning in to Deep Dive Part 2. I hope to continue these. And if you have any questions, please post them below.